The next sorting method that we're going to look at is called selection sort. And very possibly this is a method that you learned previously. Um, my thinking is that you probably either learn bubble sort or you learn selection sort or possibly both in the past. But regardless, um, I won't be assuming that you know it. Selection sort's actually the most intuitive sorting method, um, I would say. Um, I, I would say that if you were given um, some objects, say, laid out on a table and asked to sort them in, in, in say, increasing order of weight or something like that, um, you'd probably wind up following a strategy that is basically selection sort. Okay, and the performance of selection sort, it's very comparable to bubble sort. Okay, so, so what does it mean to say that they have comparable performance? Basically means that the time it takes for them to sort a list of a, of a given size, um, an array of a given size, is, is about the same. We'll get more detailed about that later. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so here's the strategy for selection sort. Um, again, it's, it's pretty much the most intuitive um, strategy. Because um, all you do is you take a pass through the array looking for either the smallest or the largest entry in the array. Okay? And once you find it, you move it into the correct position. So let's, uh, just for consistency's sake, let's focus on the version of selection sort that searches for the smallest entry. You probably have experience with going through an array um, looking for either the largest or the smallest entry in the array. Um, but... In doing so, there's a, there's a good chance that you were focused on just finding what that value was, um, whereas for our purposes, we need to remember where that value is in the array. Okay? So, as I said, we want to go search for the smallest entry, and um, as we're searching through the array... Um, we need to keep track of where the smallest entry is. Uh, every time we find a new entry that's smaller than anything we've seen so far, then we have to remember where that, that new entry is. Okay? So first let me do it um, by means of this uh, diagram, this diagrammatic example, using um, some arrows. Um, so I'm taking the same array that we used uh, as an example for bubble sort, but now I'm going to uh, use the selection sort strategy, and I'm going to use a black arrow to show which entry we're currently examining, and I'm also going to use a red arrow um, to, to point to the entry that is the smallest entry seen so far. We start off then with both arrows pointing to the start of the array, and then we advance the black arrow to point to the next entry, which is 17. Um, and observing that 17 um, is less than the entry pointed to by the red arrow, we uh, reason that, okay, we just found a, a new smallest entry, and therefore, we uh, reposition the red arrow to point to it. Okay, so now both arrows are pointing to 17. Okay, the black arrow advances again, but now it's pointing to a number that's bigger than the number pointed to by the red arrow, so we ignore 92 
um, and move on. We advance the black arrow once again. It's pointing to five, but since five is now the new smallest number, um, we change the red arrow to point to it. Then we advance the black pointer again, but it's pointing to something bigger. Advance the black pointer again. Um, it's still pointing to something bigger. And we've hit the end of the array. By the time we've made that complete pass through the array, the red arrow is, of course, pointing to the smallest entry in the array as required. Okay, once we're done with this pass, and we know where the smallest entry is, then it's a simple matter to swap that entry with first entry in the array. Okay, and we get this. 5 and 63 have traded places. We now have the number 5 at the beginning of the array where it belongs. Then, as you probably guessed, we repeat the whole thing. Um, we go through a second pass of the array, but this time we begin um, at the second position. We ignore the first position, of course. That's obvious. We've got the first position um, correctly. Uh, the number five is correctly situated in the first position, so we ignore that. And we start a second pass with both arrows pointing to the second entry, which is 17. And then a black arrow moves on, points to 92, but 92 is bigger than 17. So it moves on again. And as it turns out, it goes all the way to the end. Eventually, the black arrow gets to the number 21. And the red arrow continues to point to 17 because no number smaller than 17 was discovered along the way. Okay. So the time has come then as you would expect, to swap the entry that the red arrow is pointing to with the second position uh, entry. But of course, in this example, they're the same thing. Um, in general, we would be swapping whatever the red arrow points to with whatever's in the second position. But since that's exactly the same thing here, there's no change. Okay? On a third pass... Um, let's see, on a third pass, both arrows would begin by pointing to 92, and then as they proceed, um, the number 21 would be discovered to be the smallest entry, so after that third pass, the 21 and the 92 would trade places, and we'd arrive at this situation down here at the bottom. Okay, that's at the end of three passes. Now, Similar to what happened to us with bubble sort, after three passes, we actually have the array um, completely sorted. Um, but that is in part due to luck. And in general, uh, more than three passes would be required to sort an array of, of size six. And um, perhaps you did this, but things are very similar to what we saw with bubble sort. Namely, if we're sorting an array of size n, then in total, we're going to need n minus 1 passes, or at least um, n minus 1 passes is, is sufficient to guarantee that any array of size n will be sorted. OK? Uh, the first pass requires n minus 1 comparisons. Go, go back and check that. During the first pass, there are n minus 1 comparisons. In the example, n was 6, so there are exactly 5 comparisons during the first pass. Okay. During the second pass, there are only n minus 2 comparisons. During the third pass, there are n minus 3 comparisons, and so forth. And then on the last pass, there's only a single comparison. Um, so that aspect of things is exactly as it was with bubble sort. Once again, when I speak about the first position of the array, I actually mean um, position number zero. Okay? 
So next thing is uh, we'll take a look at the code that I'm providing for selection sort. And um, just like with bubble sort code, the variable size is going to actually play the role of n, meaning it's the number of numbers being sorted. OK, so here now is the entire code um, for selection sort. Um, again, this is exactly the code that's supplied in the C++ and the Java examples that you can download from the course site. Um, so here we go. Um, probably doesn't surprise you that there is, again, a nesting of two loops. That, that is just like with bubble sort. Um, in fact, the roles of the two loops are pretty much like with bubble sort. The outer loop, which has i as a counter uh, uh, variable here, um, that outer loop is responsible for making multiple passes through the array. And then the inner loop, which uses j, j is the counter variable. We'll talk about min in a second, but j is the counter variable and that that counts uh, that gets incremented, frankly, every time through the inner loop, and and the inner loop is responsible for doing one particular pass through the array. Okay. Now, what is the body of the inner loop? And and this again, I don't want you to get thrown by this. The absence of curly brackets and so forth. Once again, I have you know carefully indented things to help you see this and reason it out. Um, the inner loop has a body that consists only of that line, that, that if statement. Okay, That if statement on the third line is the entirety of the inner loop's body. Okay, So that's where things now are really quite different than bubble sort. Um, bubble sort had an inner loop body that did some swapping and whatnot. Um, this inner loop body just compares two entries in the array and then potentially based on that sets min equal to j. Okay? What it's actually doing is uh, well look, to, to make the connection to what we just looked at in, in the figures, um, the index j here is playing the role of the black arrow that we looked at. And the index min is playing the arrow of the red is playing the role of the red arrow, okay? So what this is basically saying is, if the new entry that we're looking at using the black arrow is less than the entry that the red arrow is pointing to, then change the red arrow to point to the same thing that the black arrow is pointing to, okay? So in other words, if we find something that's smaller than what the red arrow is currently pointing to, then it's time to change the red arrow so that it points to that new thing. Okay? Yeah, something to watch out for here. Notice that I'm using min as an index into the array. Min is telling us where in the array the minimum entry is. Min itself is not, not the minimum, array, uh, minimum <coughs> entry. Okay? It's just the position of the minimum entry. OK, and that's it. That's all the inner loop is supposed to do. It's supposed to make a pass through the array and locate the minimum entry in it. OK? All right, after the inner loop comes the swapping. OK, so the last three lines, the last three statements down here inside the outer loop, the last three statements are basically saying, take whatever. Uh, is whatever the minimum entry is and swap it with whatever's in position i. Okay, it's basically saying to <coughs> swap the minimum entry discovered into the correct position. Okay? Now, okay, the missing piece of the puzzle, what I really haven't, maybe I should have talked about earlier, um, we said that the outer loop has a variable i and it goes from 0 up to size minus 1. Okay, so um, 
The first time we go through the outer loop, that corresponds to the first pass through the array, the first time we go through the outer loop, the value of i is going to be zero. So the minimum entry that's discovered by means of the inner loop is going to get swapped into position zero in the array, which of course is perfect. That's exactly where we want the minimum entry to, to go. We want to put it into position zero. Okay? The second time through the loop, the value of i is going to be one. All right, that means the second time we go through the, the second time uh, we will swap the minimum entry discovered into position one. And that, of course, is exactly as it should be. All right? So now I think the only detail that I've left out is the initialization part of the inner loop. So let's look at the inner loop header again. The inner loop header says for min equal i comma j equals i plus 1 semicolon blah blah blah. Um, I'm not sure, you may not be used to this, but in fact that entire construction that says min equals i comma j equals i plus 1 is in fact the initialization part of this for loop. So before this inner loop starts looping, it sets min equal to i, and it sets j equal to i plus 1. And frankly, it would be okay if we changed that j equals i plus 1 to j equals i. Um, reason I say that is this code is slightly inconsistent with my diagram earlier. Um, in my diagrams, before I started, at the beginning of each pass through the array, what I did was set the black arrow and the red arrow pointing to the beginning of the section of the array that we were going we to scan through. Okay? Um, here, what I'm doing with this code basically is setting the black arrow immediately after the red arrow. Okay? Um, I is going to be the position that we're starting from during this current pass through the array. And min is set equal to i. That's like setting the red arrow to the beginning of that section of the array. Okay. Um, but j is set equal to i plus 1, so that's like setting the black arrow immediately after the red arrow. That doesn't really change the behavior of the algorithm, though. So... Um, I invite you to take a careful look at all that and um, check the details. The next few slides are just going to reiterate the points that I've made here. So I do not plan to speak over those next couple slides. Um, I'll just slowly present them to you and ask you to double check what's being said here. Okay, um, just as I said with bubble sort, I'll just harp on it one more time. It really is important that you take a look at this code in detail. Uh, I'll try to, try to resist the temptation to say this over and over again, but unless you look at code in detail, there's really no point in looking at it at all. Okay, um, so... Once again, too, the Java and C++ sorting code is available at the website. It includes the sorting algorithm code, and eventually I'm going to want you to look at it when we compare the algorithms. Um, but you might want to go ahead and download it sooner than later and, and get it running. When you feel like you're ready, just as you did with the bubble sort algorithm, go ahead and take the self-quiz. And um, make sure you're comfortable with all this before you do, and you should be fine.